What's creepier? Creepy kids or creepy pets? How about both? Pet Cemetery gave us the blueprint for creepy cute kid and cat as well as a whole lot of other things. This is a special adaptation of Stephen King's work that has a lot of fans and of course, some detractors. As it stands, this first adaptation is heads and shoulders above its remake, or rather the second adaptation of the same story for many reasons. Here's one horror girl's view on this late 1980s horror classic. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. One of many Stephen King adaptations to grace the screens in the 1980s, this one is a favorite for many and for good reasons. Here we have an adaptation that took some liberties and adjusted a few things, but not changing all that much in the end. A big reason for this is that Stephen King himself did the adaptation and wrote the film's screenplay, giving it more than just his stamp of approval, but giving it life himself. His work as a screenwriter here is fantastic and makes for a great theatrical viewing if given the chance, or home video watch if not. For those not in the know, once arrived at their new home, they discover that they live on a very busy road without any fencing or safety to protect them. They also meet a sweet elderly neighbor who seems full of good intentions, at least at first. I live just across the road. Soon they find themselves on a walk behind the property where they find a pet cemetery. Friendly neighbor man later explains what it does to the dad as they share beers and lets him know that sometimes that is better. Setting the tone for the rest of the film. The family cat gets killed by a truck on that unsafe road and dad finds out that he doesn't have the heart to tell his little girl about it and decides to test that pet cemetery's powers. Of course, once his family is back home, he soon finds out that dead is indeed better to a sweet then immediately traumatizing sequence where the family's toddler Gage is run over by a massive truck. Dad knows better but can't leave well enough alone as he mourns his baby and is inconsolable. This leads to the best bits in the film, those scenes with toddler Gage looking both absolutely adorable and creepy as they make them. He speaks but few words but makes them count and he wants to kill, kill, kill. Can someone so cute really be this evil? Well. When this cutie was buried in the pet cemetery, he clearly came back with something more. A need for blood. A need to kill. He's adorably deadly, even at his tiny size. This of course leads to dad having to handle things. No fair. Then mom coming back, dying. Because she just died. She just died a little while ago. Cycles the who problem all over again. This man, Lewis Creed, just does not learn his lesson. With King writing, director Mary Lambert creates a strong film with some truly, absolutely creepy moments that make the skin crawl to this day. Her work here is solid and she has the right touch for the material at hand and the atmosphere needed to pull this one off. This film has some truly creepy sequences that crawl under the skin. The backstory of Miss Creed and her sister Zelda is something else, which while not entirely needed, adds a truly creepy angle and something else for the mother to have in her past to make her weary of losing people. Mr. Creed also gets his moment early on in the film where he deals with death, that of a student hit by a vehicle on campus, that brings him to his very own ghost to warn him to guide him in that way. Even Mr. Crandall, the helpful neighbor, has his own side story of sadness and creepiness. These three side stories could have easily been omitted here, and the film would have just functioned fine, but they add truly something great and flesh out the characters as well as the film. Of course, the kids and the cat don't really get much backstory, but that's expected here. Now a quick comparison with the remake from 2019. In the remake, the kid who dies is the older one, the daughter, something that helps the filmmaker to get a character who can more believably stalk and kill folks, one who is more able and able of more. This was honestly a mistake. Gage in the 1989 version is much creepier than Ellie in the 2019 version, needing less screen time and being more effectively creepy. The fact that he can't fully speak, that he's limited by his tiny size, that he's just so darn adorable, make his death that much sadder and his murder gaze when he comes back from the death that much harder hitting. He's innocent, yet fully corrupted, which is entirely the point here. The place we're going is on the other side of that. For some fans, this fan included, his turn from so freaking sweet to murder baby is the main part of the film, even though it's not the longest part. Church the Cat gets more time for mayhem, but something about it feels like a precursor to something else, and well, the something else is Killer Gage. Of course, we do get Killer Mommy later on, but she's the final straw. The, you didn't learn your lesson, now pay. She's important and so is her death and subsequent turning, but she's not the main one here. 
This is one of the main reasons why I keep going back to this one over and over again, part of why this film is a solid 8 out of 10 over 30 years later. The above mentioned writing by Stephen King is solid here. The directing by Mary Lambert is on point. The acting is fantastic as well. Here, the lead is Dale Midkiff as Lewis Creed, giving an emotional performance that gets more and more involved as the film advances. He does great work with the part and really brings it home in the last third. Playing Rachel Creed is Denise Crosby, who does quite well too. Her work here gives balance to Midkiff and really gives the late 80s mom vibe to the character. She also gets more of a juicy part at the end and it's a great watch. Playing the kids are Blaze Berdahl as Ellie and Miko Hughes as Gage. Berdahl gets a few good bits of acting in here and does the most out of them, but with her character dispatched to her maternal grandparents fairly quickly, she mostly gets to cry on the phone and not really be there for the fun horror chaos. Hughes gets the interesting part here getting an insane kill scene and then getting to come back as a zombie baby. Of course, he was but a wee one when this was filmed, but he does good work considering everything. Yes, his performance hinges mostly on him being adorable and then doing unspeakable things while being adorable. So it's as good of a performance as a little kid can give here. Playing the neighbor Jed Crandall is Fred Gwynn, who steals scenes even while being the exposition character of the film. Without him and his work, the character of Judd could have just been so bland and just plain annoying. But Gwen really takes the part and makes it something worth watching. His face-off with Zombie Gage is fun from a horror point of view. As an aside for those who might be interested, Miko Hughes appeared in the music video for Funeral Derangements by Ice Nine Kill in a fun homage to Pet Cemetery, where he plays a reckless truck driver. That music video is filled with cameos and a bunch of fun for horror fans. Back to the film we're loving on here. Pet Cemetery also boasts great practical special effects, a sign of a great 1980s horror, and something more current releases could use remembering. The work here by David Leroy Anderson, Lance Anderson, and John Blake shows what is really there in the scene often works better in getting a reaction out of the cast and the viewer. The ooey gooey stuff here looks fantastic. Another aside, David Leroy Anderson is married to Heather Langenkamp, who plays herself and the mother to Miko Hughes in the amazing new nightmare and where her husband is an effects artist. Yeah, the horror trivia runs deep here. Now, there are plenty of reasons to love this film, and one major still to this day is the theme song when the credits roll by the Ramones. The Ramones! Yes, it's exciting to a happy nerd girl to have a track by the Ramones close a favorite horror film. They are perfect for this. Their music is perfect for this. As it is on the credits only, it's really easy to enjoy it. But it's also easy to wish they had more music on the soundtrack. However, the score by Elliot Goldenthal is fantastic here, giving just the right support throughout the film and helping with the creepy factor by supporting it just right. Scoring a film like this can make or break a scene, and here it makes all the scenes better, by being subtle when need be, and more in your face when needed. The Cinematography here goes with the story and the music, really giving the viewers images that both work and look good. The work by Peter Stein really showcases the horror and the hauntingly creepy sequences. The bits with Zelda, the ghost of the dead student scenes, a gauge as a zombie baby is filmed. It's all framed carefully, giving the film just the right ick factor. The scene where Gage dies, the truck coming at him, the little shoe flying onto the ground, the way it's all filmed, the way we don't actually see the impact, but feel it as an audience really gives the film its tone. And the work to create this is not simply good writing and good directing, but the cinematography with the hand from the editing is central here, giving the sequence life, or rather death in a way that is just shocking and sad and horrific and so much more. The scene has layers and layers in its visual aspect as well as the sound. It's a hard hitting scene and it's such a strong start to the horror beyond church here. One small complaint here is that a truck that size hitting a toddler, there should be no toddler to bring back. Get that baby! This kid would be a pile of mush. However, we all know that would not work for the story here, so we'll assume the truck was able to slow down enough before hitting the cherub and hit him just enough to kill him, but not enough to turn him to paste. With all this said, Pet Cemetery earns its 8 out of 10 easily, and even this many years later, it maintains its effect, especially on new viewers, but also of fans who have been vocal online about loving it. The remake did decent enough at the box office, but Fans of the original seem more annoyed at it than anything. The 1989 film has a sequel as well, starring Edward Furlong, still Eddie at the time, which came out in 1992. The sequel is fun, but nowhere as effective as the first film. The 1989 adaptation is strong, and definitely gains from having its script written by the man himself, Stephen King, giving any change made more standing in the hearts and heads of his fans. 
As a fan of mainly Stephen King adaptations over his book work, yeah, I said it. This one is fun. It's horrific. It's one that makes little hairs on the back of the neck stand up. It's a film that is memorable and one that is almost perfect. The fact that it's still creepy this many years and this many rewatches later speaks volumes on the film's effectiveness and entertainment value.